iron horse. What American does not thrill to the sight of a speeding train? The biggest thing that moves on land here is mass action. Today, the economic importance of the steam locomotive can hardly be overestimated. In peace and war, it ties our far-flung country together, possible for our commerce and industries to function. It brings us our daily food from quarters of the land and carries us on business and pleasure safely and in comfort. It has been one of the essential creators of the America we know today. Probably the most famous locomotive in the world is the giant Hudson type, developed by the New York Central in 1927. Since then, nearly 300 of them have been in use on famous mainline passenger trains of the Central's great steel fleet. No other locomotive has ever caught the public fancy like this one, or attained such an enviable record for operating efficiency. The steam locomotive is one of the most compact power plants in the world. Within comparatively close limits are 300 tons of machinery, every pound designed for the most grueling work. Each engine costs nearly $200,000. Perhaps you wonder why a locomotive is such a complicated and expensive piece of machinery. Well, let's take a look at some of the answers. Since the day James Watt discovered the power of steam, it has been serving mankind. It is the prime mover of the steam locomotive. The largest part of the engine is the boiler, where water is turned into steam by a white-hot fire. Stripped of its insulating jacket, a boiler looks like a long tank with a box built in one end. The fire box is similar to that in your furnace at home and is built to hold a fire which drives its heat through long tubes surrounded by water. The water absorbs heat from the tubes and the result is steam in enormous quantities. The smoke and burn gases finally reach the front of the boiler and are discharged into a smoke box. From here, they reach the open air through the smoke stack. To produce mechanical energy, the tremendous power of expanding steam must be properly harnessed. In a locomotive, this is accomplished by utilizing cylinders, pistons, connecting rods, and wheels. In this cutaway model, the fundamental parts are shown in action. This relatively simple appearing machinery is the result of more than 100 years of constant research and experimentation which is still being pressed. The power stroke begins when the valve allows steam to flow into the cylinder. Its expanding force pushes the piston to the other end of the cylinder. In the meantime, the valve again moves allowing the steam to push the piston back. The pushing and pulling of the piston is linked to all wheels by rods. Thus, the force of each stroke reaches all drive wheels at once. Although this mechanism produces the actual power, there are many other accessory devices which are necessary to make the modern engine safe and efficient. The whistle might be called the voice of the engine man. Its blast warns trespassers and communicates signals. The automatic bell cautions that the engine is moving or about to start. When the pressure becomes too great, safety valves allow the steam to escape. Among the many pipes on the side of the engine are those carrying water from the tender to the pump, which forces it into the boiler. Another device, called an injector, is used to supplement the action of the pump. On top of the boiler is located a small steam-driven generator. This supplies electricity for the headlight, automatic train stop device, and various lights in the cab. Two pumps supply compressed air for the brake equipment, bell ringer, and other accessories. Strong reservoirs hold the air at a pressure of 140 pounds per square inch. The brakes are iron shoes held against the wheels by air pressure. A slight twist of the engine man's brake handle applies the friction. When the rails are slippery from rain or snow, it is necessary to use sand to provide traction. It is stored in a compartment on top of the boiler, 
and fed through pipes by compressed air. The flow is controlled by the engine man. Important as the engine itself, the tender rides along behind, carrying fuel and water. The huge coal bin holds enough to run the engine for hundreds of miles. Water for the boiler, air for the train brakes, and steam for heating the cars are carried through flexible couplings. Coal is brought forward from the tender by a revolving screw, which crushes large lumps as it moves them through a tube to the firebox door. As the coal emerges from the tube, it is sprayed to all parts of the fire by jets of steam, regulated by the fireman. The jets point in different directions, thus the coal may be set where it is most needed. After the first adjustments have been made, the fireman can regulate the stoker so that a constant spray of coal will be fed to the fire. On the larger locomotives of today, a man cannot shovel coal fast enough to develop the full power of the boiler. On the rear of the tender are the coupler and other connections. The entire pulling power of the locomotive is transmitted by this steel knuckle. The pipes carry steam heat, air for the brakes, and air for the communicating signal. Locomotives do not earn their keep when standing still. The interest charges on an investment of nearly $200,000 a unit run so high that it's good business to keep engines in operation as much as possible. Each engine is put through a tailed routine of checking, lubricating, and repairing, much of which is prescribed by law. The first step in servicing is performed on the ash pit. Here, the fire is dumped into a concrete pit filled with water. The hoppers are washed clean and the grates tilted so that the firebox is empty. As soon as the fire is dumped, the steam pressure begins to drop. However, the insulation on the boiler is so efficient that it will hold steam long enough to move the engine into the roundhouse. Railroad management believes that its equipment must not only run well, but look well. Good old-fashioned scrubbing with plenty of soap and water does the job. It is all part of a gigantic housekeeping task that employs thousands of men and women on the railroad. Normally, an engine is cleaned before it goes into the engine house. A sample of water from each incoming locomotive is tested to determine the amount of dissolved or scale-forming solids in the boiler. If the proportion is too high, it is necessary to change the water in the boiler to prevent foaming and poor steaming. All water used by locomotives is treated to keep scale formation to a minimum. The major part of servicing takes place in the busy engine house. Built in the form of a semicircle, it is commonly called a roundhouse. By means of a turntable, engines may be quickly placed in the proper stall. It's interesting to find railroad terms such as stall and hostler, which have persisted from stagecoach days. Hostlers are the men who run the locomotives at engine terminals. They handle these unwieldy giants with great skill and precision. No sooner does a locomotive enter a stall than its inspection report is placed beside it. Provision is made for dozens of entries and signatures, for everything that is done to an engine must be signed for by workmen. The engine man who last ran the locomotive has already reported on its performance, and his remarks guide the roundhouse men in their work. Activity begins at once. Though the boiler is still warm, the inspectors climb in and start their painstaking work. The firebox in the rear and the smoke box in front get careful attention.
Machinery inspectors check the mechanical parts to detect flaws and loose bolts. They must use their sense of hearing and sense of touch as well as their eyesight. During the checking of air equipment, a flaming torch serves a double purpose. Besides giving light, its flame makes otherwise invisible leaks apparent. Because of other noises, the inspector cannot depend on hearing a telltale hiss of escaping air. During most of its stay in the roundhouse, the locomotive is subjected to inspections of many kinds. Here, the electrical parts come in for their share. Each inspector is an expert in his life. By using crews of skilled men in definite routines, it is possible to service these engines in a few hours. Unlike most industries, the railroad must operate on a rigid time schedule. This means that no delays can be tolerated except under the most unusual circumstances. The men who operate the trains must be backed by vast behind the scenes facilities. An engine terminal employs hundreds of mechanics working at many different trains. Aided by modern, efficient tools, these men are constantly winning a race against time. Many come from families whose men have been railroad workers for generations. They have a deep-rooted pride in their work, and their spirit plays no small part in keeping the trains rolling during extremely difficult times. Regardless of weather, the work must go on day and night to provide a steady stream of locomotives to keep America's transportation lines open. In addition to the routine inspection, it is sometimes necessary to make various repairs. More extensive inspection and overhauling is scheduled on a monthly, quarterly, and annual basis. A complete reconditioning is done after the locomotive has run a specified number of miles. Most roundhouses are provided with special apparatus for changing wheels. This operation is done by electric elevators, which lower the wheels into a pit after they have been detached from the engine frame. After they have been lowered, they are moved to one side and brought up to floor level again. In sharp contrast to the ponderous work of removing wheels is the inspection and calibration of the delicate valve pilot. In this small box is a recording apparatus which gives a graphic picture of the locomotive's performance. Pencils trace lines on a moving paper tape to tell the story. One makes a chart of the engine's speed and another tells how efficiently it is operating. The records are used to determine such things as fuel and water consumption and other important factors in the locomotive's operation. After each run, the tape is removed and sent to a central office for analysis. Through the study of these records, it is often possible to effect improvements in locomotive operation. When something breaks, it is important to know the reason. Detailed reports of the failure are sent to the railroad's own engineering test laboratories for study. Some cracks cannot be seen by the naked eye, but an ingenious electromagnetic device detects flaws in metal parts. Metallic dust sprinkled on the surface will form ridges when the unit approaches a hidden crack. Lubrication, the final roundhouse operation, requires more than a dozen different oils and greases. While the work is being completed, the terminal foreman is receiving a list of scheduled trains with the number of cars in each. With his assistance, he assigns the locomotives for the day's work. A bulletin board tells hostlers when and where the engines will be needed. At last, the time comes when the prepared locomotive must be moved out to the ready track. It's an inspiring sight to see these monsters roll majestically out of their stalls. They stand panting like racehorses, and they are swung around to the outgoing track. They almost seem alive to the men who work with them, and each one appears to have a personality all its own. It's easy to see why the locomotive has such a strong appeal for the average person. Because of their sleek lines and powerful appearance, 
the Hudson-type engines have been copied by toy manufacturers and model makers ever since they were first built. Their performance records have been outstanding in the railroad world. The coaling plant is the next stop. Some engine terminals use over a thousand tons a day of this specially graded soft coal. The problem of securing an adequate supply of water satisfactory for locomotives is a serious one. The New York Central spends over two and a half million dollars each year for this purpose. The water must be treated and stored in sufficient quantities to guard against the possibility of shortage. These locomotives use about six barrels of water a minute when running at high speeds. In order to keep up with this demand without the delay of frequent stops, the engine must pick up water while running. It is taken from a long pan between the rails. A scoop is lowered when the pan is reached and the speed engine sends the water up into the tender cistern. Track pans are located at approximately 40 mile intervals along the main line. Moving to the ready track is the final operation at the engine terminal. Here the locomotives are lined up in the order in which their trains will leave. Every part of the engines has been inspected and put in proper working order. The locomotive in action is a magnificent sight. When the starting signal comes, the engine man's hand is on the throttle lever. A gentle tug, and the steam roars into the cylinders. The giant moves. Every ounce of its 5,000 horsepower is brought to play to pull more than 1,000 tons of passenger cars. As the train gathers speed, the exhaust beats come in a faster cadence. The locomotive is using a vast quantity of steam at this point, and the fireman must adjust his stoker to make a clean, hot fire. By skillful manipulation, he feeds the coal just fast enough to make a roaring fire with almost no smoke. A great deal depends on how well his job is done, for lack of steam prevents the engine man from making his scheduled speed. The bark of the exhaust deepens into a roar as the train speeds faster. The reason for the painstaking inspection and soon becomes apparent when one sees this traveling powerhouse at its terrific job. With his own keen judgment and the cooperation of his firemen, the engine man make his locomotive perform to perfection. This combination, matchless skill and superb machinery has done much to make the New Central famous throughout the world. Here is steam power in its most exciting development.